Well, that being said, when you think about this new series, Strap, we're talking about why is more, you know, why more is just never enough. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Have you ever wondered why getting ahead financially is such a challenge? You ever thought about it? You ever thought about, man, why is when it comes to uh, finances, why there's more month than there is money? <laughs> You know, a lot of times we can look around and, and I know there's an effects of it over the past several years. I don't know if you know this, but inflation is at a 41-year high in our nation. I don't know if you know this, but I want you to understand that gasoline, you'll agree with me, is up 57%. That's, that's a lot from what it was. When you look at groceries, up like 26 to 27%. You look at rent, rent is up over 25%. When you take a look at what's going on with interest rates, interest rates have more than doubled. A lot of people are having tough times even buying a home. And also, this is what's crazy post, you know, pretty well post uh, pandemic. People are using credit cards to the tune. It's up 35% more. And for the first time in this nation's history, Credit card debt has eclipsed, in this nation, over $1 trillion. So, when we think about, when it comes to financial things, how is it that so many people, too many people are living in a financial debt and living in all stress that goes along with that? And I know, that, and I want to share with you, the good news is over these several weeks, I want to give you some biblical principles that's going to help you with this and help you to be able to learn how to get out of financial bondage. Because listen, your financial bondage is not tied to the economy. It's not tied to the gas prices. It's not tied, it's tied to your relationship with Jesus and how you apply his biblical practical principles to be able to free ourselves from being strapped. So let me ask this question. How many of you here on the sound of my voice has ever done something stupid with money? Raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> I think everybody has done something stupid when it comes to money, when it comes to stewardship. And uh, how, so how come we struggle so much with money. Think about it. One word. Materialism. Be honest. It's hard for you and I to say no. We always want more stuff. We always want more stuff. And, and the thing about it is, I, I'm the same way. We always want more stuff. I remember when I was 20 years old, I bought a 1969 Camaro. Check this out. Now, okay. I had it two weeks. Somebody pulled out in front of me, wrapped it around a tree, completely totaled it. Well, I've had this innate desire since then that I need another 69 Camaro. You know, and so I've been looking at them. I've been looking on Marketplace. I've looked all over the country looking for a 69 Camaro. And you know what? They cost as much as my first home in five acres. So, I'm sitting here dealing with the fact of there's one spirit in me, that desire says, Terrell, you want it. Terrell, you deserve it. Terrell, you're going to be happy. Over on this other voice says, Terrell, you're going to regret it. You ain't got a building to put it in. You'll have to build a building around it and all those voices. But I succumbed to buying a 69 Camaro. Here it is. You know, zoom in on that. It's a 69 Camaro, four-speed, and it, it runs pretty good, you know. The only problem is with it, when I get down here and run it, I can't, uh, I can't ride in it. That's the issue. So, how many of you are like me? You got your desires on one side. You say, I work really hard. I deserve this. I need it. I want it. It's going to make me happier. But then there's another voice that speaks to you and says, <laughs> that's not such a good idea. You're going to regret this. Not smart. You understand what I'm saying? Say yes. yes. So the choice is between two, two desires that we have. And the question is, what are we going to choose? Am I going to choose that I want to get this new house because it's up and coming subdivision? Am I going to choose to get that car? Am I going to choose to get that TV? Am I going to choose to get that new Prada purse that's in the line that you ladies love? Or am I going to get those new golf clubs? See, the thing about it is, it's always been said, we often buy things that we don't need 
with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like, right? So, with that being said, we all face materialism. It is a struggle, especially in our culture. You might be thinking, well, you don't understand, Pastor. Have you seen the new iPhone 15? It's made out of titanium. And that boy saying, you need it. You got it. You work. Your emails. All this stuff. And the other boy's over saying, uh, you don't need that. You know, you're, you're not in even the double digits yet. You're three, four versions, five versions down. You're in an iPhone 8. You know, so that's always a struggle on what we deal with. And so it's just tough being able to tell ourselves that contentment is the key, right? So materialism is a continual temptation that we all face here on the sound of my voice and that we say to ourselves that we need it. We got to have it. We're going to be happier. And trust me, you're never happier. Seriously. After you get it. Matter of fact, we're more empty, we're more in debt, and we're more miserable. And then when you come to church, you'd like to give, but you justify why you don't. And really, it hurts to get in on what God is doing. So the Bible teaches us that there's a battle within every heart of every person that follows Jesus between doing God's desires or chasing our own desires. So today, I want to jump in. If you pull out your message notes or turn on the app, that you've got there, or in, in, and you can follow along with me. But I want you to look at what Paul told the church at Philippi, at Philippi here in 2 and 13. He says, for God is working in you. Look at the person next to you and say, God is working in you. <laughs> Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. See, when you become a Christ follower, And you give your life to Christ, you're born again, God's Spirit enters your life and He begins to give you desires to be able to do that which is right. That when you come to your relationship that you seek Him with all your heart. You read His Word because His Word is your heart. You begin to talk to Him and you pray to Him. You begin to get the desire to treat people around you with love and respect and honor. You do what you can do to be able to be, be a good husband or a good wife. You begin to be the person that's going to work hard and and work for your family family and what you're doing. You also want to let God, and God gives you desire to be a good steward of the financial wherewithal that He gives you. God gives you the desire to get out of debt and, and to be able to invest in His kingdom and invest money wisely, not mismanage that what God blesses you with. To bring tithes and offerings to God's church so you want to further the kingdom of God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God puts this desire in your heart. But, everybody say, but, Conjunction, junction, what's your function? You still have your own desires that are still there. Look at this next verse, Proverbs 27, 20. Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so say these next five words with me. Human desire is never satisfied. You might want to underline that. You might want to make it a refrigerator verse or put it on the rear view mirror of your car. Desire to get more. Desire to be able to have more. And we're thinking it's going to bring make us happy, which it will never satisfy. Our human desire, the voice that's in us that says, I want it, I need it, I got to have it, I'm going to be happy, I deserve it. Listen. If you put your desires before God's desires in your life, which is materialism, you're going to be miserable. That's just the way it is. So the question is today, how do we replace the desire of materialism with God's desires for us to be able to gain that proper biblical perspective when it comes to money and finances? Three biblical truths I'll throw out at you. Money is personal. I'll just be honest with you. It's personal. Here's what blows my mind about social media. I've never witnessed a time that people will throw all their deepest, darkest secrets and everything they're going through on social media. They'll tell it all. And if it's you, don't raise your hand. However, say however. When it comes to money and financial issues, we're less reluctant to be able to talk about it. In other words, let me give you an example. Let me, let me get you to do this. I want everybody here to lean to your neighbor in just a second, and I want you to tell them exactly how much money you make this year and tell them exactly how much debt you've got. <laughs> I don't see anybody talking to each other because it's personal, right? It's between you 
and God. And you're thinking, I might tell some other stuff, but I'm not telling that. Also, money is powerful. You say, well, what do you mean by that? I love this quote here by the American political philosopher, Philip Green. It defines what power is. A power is the ability to be able to modify how others behave. That's a good definition. You say, well, how does that work? All right, I have a like page on Facebook as a pastor for our church, and some of you have probably liked my page. How many of you have not liked my page? Raise your hand. Okay, (laughs) shame on you. But anyway, um, I could say this. I'm going to give each of you that's not like my page $1,000. How many of you will go today if I said I'm going to give you a check for $1,000 and like it? Raise your hand. Man, look, that's a lot of money. Oh, my gosh. So anyway, so what it is, money's powerful, right? Because you would do that if I had the money to do that. I'd love to bless you to do it. I haven't won the lottery or something like that. I don't even play it. So anyway, but anyway, but also money is potential. It is. Money is potential. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Its value is neutral. It's not good and it's not bad. It's like this right here in my pocket. I got a $20 bill right here, this fabric right here. If I lay it down right here, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to jump up and it's not going to bite me. What determines whether money is positive or negative is my view of it, how I let it control my life, how I invest it, how I spend it, what I do with it. How many of you have ever heard that money is the root of all evil? Raise your hand all across all term. Yes, that's not what the Bible says. And here's what it says. 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says, for the love of money, say love of money, money. is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. You might want to underline those four words, the love of money. Money isn't evil, but the love of money can lead to all kinds of evil things in your life. When your perspective of money gets really warped, it can mess up your life. It can help you to be able to get your priorities completely out of order. And when money gets a higher priority than God does in our life, and we love money more than we love God, listen to me, that's materialism. That's exactly what it is. Materialism is a condition of my heart to where I am preoccupied with material things of the world more than I'm preoccupied with the spiritual things of my life with God. That's what gets and and it supersedes us. See, materialism is an issue of the heart. Debt is an issue of the heart. Mismanagement of finances is an issue of the heart. Overspending is an issue of the heart. That's what it is. What I'm talking about here are the important things to be able to honor God. Now, I'm going to give you some great steps, but it's up to you whether you want to do it or not, or you want to continue being strapped for those that you may be strapped right now. I'm going to give you a plan. I'm going to talk about things to be able to develop, to be able to help you. But if your heart's not right, it's not going to do you any good to be able to get out of debt, to be able to know that materialism will mess you up, that it is a heart issue. God doesn't bless a mess, okay? But God will bless you to get out of a mess when you get your heart right. He will not bless mismanagement of what he blesses you with. I hope you understand that. Look what Jesus said himself in Matthew 6 and 24. He said, no one, say no one, can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. God can't be first place in your life if money is first place in your life. It can only be one is in control. It's either going to be money or it's going to be God. You need to, make, you need to ask yourself that question. And the question is this, what's in control of your life? Is it money or is it God? Because Maybe you realize right now that you've been struggling with money for quite some time. You know why you struggle with money? Once again, it goes back to materialism. Is your problem with money getting in the way of what God wants to do in your life? God wants to bless your life. I promise you that. It's when you steward the blessings he gives you in his way and in his will. So there's a few things I want to share with you about how can I get released of this financial straps that's continually been on my life. How do I get through that? First thing you've got to do, you've got to own it that you've got a problem with it. And you say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Most people, even Christians, listen to me, they live in complete denial that their money is in a mess, that they're in debt. They're living paycheck to paycheck, which about 70% of the people in this nation are one paycheck away from disaster. You can't honor God 
God financially. And you think, well, I, I tip God. God understands. No, God understands you're not honoring Him. You can't say it's not a big deal. And then I have people come up to me and they say this. They say, Pastor, I don't think you should talk about money in church. Ooh, it is getting tense in the house today. Did you know? Look at the person next to you and say, did you know? Well, if you didn't know, I'm going to tell you. Jesus, when he walked the earth, talked more about financial stewardship and how that we steward ourselves with the material things of life than he ever did about heaven or hell. Why would Jesus do that? Because he knew that you and I were going to struggle with it. We live in a materialistic world. And he's wanting to help us to be able to do it his will and his way. But when things are messy, when, you, and when things get all messed up and, and things are not going so good, what do we end up doing? We talk to him and say, God, I'm struggling financially. God, will you bless me? We want to snuggle up really, really close to God and say, God, help me. We're in a, a financial mess. And he's thinking, okay, you want me to help you? Oh, you need me. Okay, I will bless you. But listen, you, there are some things that I need for you to do as well and it speaks truth into our lives. And what do we do a lot of times? We pull back. It stops us short of doing something that He wants us to be able to do. And what is it that stops us short of doing something God wants us to do? It's our idols. It's our idols. It's those American idols. That'd make a good show, wouldn't it? Look at Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Listen, listen to this. This is interesting in chapter 14. Then some of the leaders of Israel visited me, and while they were sitting with me, then it says that this message came to me from the Lord, Ezekiel saying, Son of man, these, le these leaders, and the leaders are the so-called righteous people of the day, have set up idols in their hearts. God's letting him know that. You say, well, what is an idol? Anyone or anything that we love more than Jesus, that's an idol in your life. That's what it is. Anything you put ahead of God is an idol. It says, they have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. Why should I listen to the request? Tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. The people of Israel have set up idols in their hearts and fallen into sin. And then they go to a prophet asking for a message. So I, the Lord, will give them this kind of answer. Their great idolatry deserves. I will do this to capture the minds and hearts of all my people who have turned from me to worship their detestable idols. God says, the one thing I will speak to them about is the one thing that they're holding ahead of me. They're idols. They're idols. When you go to church, no matter what series of messages it is or whatever topic that the pastor is talking about, the thing you're going to constantly hear through the Holy Spirit of God is the one thing that you have that's ahead of God. That's what you'll hear. The moment where you feel like the pastor speaking to me today. And then that is what the topic is that you hear week after week and you don't like it. You might be thinking the pastor's always talking about sexual sin. The pastor's always talking about uh, people living together. The pastor's always talking about pornography. The pastor's always talking about addictions. Or pastor's always talking about anger. Or pastor's always talking about money. Your problem is not the topic, people. It's your idol. That you're putting ahead of God. So you got to own up, you got a problem, something else you got to do, you got to release that pride you're dealing with because pride will take you on a ride. We, you know what pride is? It's when we take credit for the good things that God has done for us in our lives. That's what pride is. Our possessions become basically the sign of how good we are, my status, my symbol, how many people follow me on Instagram and all that stuff. Pride says, hey, look at me, I'm all that in a bag of Cheetos, look at my stuff, I'm great. Tell what pride will do, will you? It'll mess your life up. It will mess you up completely. So what's God's solution to when we're strapped with that mentality of pride that's going on? You have got to take ownership and just know God is owner and provider of everything you see, taste, touch, smell that you have in your possession. It's the foundational truth that everything we have in life 
comes from God. When he gives you and I financial blessings, listen to me closely, they belong to God. They are his. You and I are to manage those blessings and use them according to how God would bless us in our lives. We want to bless him back by being a good steward of that. Now, how many of you here have ever been in a managerial position? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You've been in that. Okay. If you do good as a manager, you get blessed. If you don't do good as a manager, what do they do? They fire you, right? Well, I don't want to be fired away from great blessings of God because I choose not to manage what he's blessing my life with more. You're not going to bless a manager for your company if they're not doing a good job to manage that what you give them to be overseer of. That's the same way with God. I hope you understand what I'm talking about there. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 17. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from, say that word, above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. When you understand this truth that God is provider of every good truth, I promise you it will profoundly change your life. It will profoundly change how you do life. It will profoundly change how you see your hopes and dreams from the perspective of God. Listen, this $20 bill right here, it belongs to God. How I use it is, 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 is how that God is going to look at me, how I manage it, how I use it, how I invest it, how that I spend it. And I ask God, how do you want me to do that, God? How do you want me to invest it, God? Whatever that it is. It's so important that you understand that. You've got to get away from that pride. Another thing is, is you've got to see the problem you have with envy. Man, that is a huge deal, church, when it comes to this society living in America. Do you all agree with me? If you do, say yes. You say, well, what do you mean, pastor? Envy is a spiritual and emotional poison. Why is that? Because Envy leads us to make dumb decisions financially. We might see something that somebody has in their life and we think, we don't have it. I've got to have it. I've got to go after it. Next thing you know, you go deep in debt and you realize, man, I am in trouble. I am in over my head. I didn't mean to do that because you've got to have the cool gadgets or the better apartment or the nicer clothes. Some people call it keeping up with the Joneses, okay? We got anybody in here today with the last name Jones, right? Raise your hand real quick, real quick. Is anybody in here? Yeah, thank God you're not. But anyway, we're trying to keep up with you, right? I don't call it keeping up with the Joneses. I call it stupidity. You say, well, what do you mean? You're, you're, being, you're being a little bit, a little bit challenging here to us. It's almost like you're saying we're stupid. No, I'm not saying. We all have made stupid, fin fin stupid financial decisions. So how do you overcome it? you got to realize that you can admire something that somebody has without acquiring something somebody has. And say, God bless you, man. I'm so happy that you have it. Doesn't mean you got to go out and buy it too and do those kind of things. Look what it says in James 3 and 16. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Why have you got disorder? Because of what you're doing and making a dumb decision, moving toward envy. And then whenever you have disorder, it causes confusion. And evil can come into your life because of the decisions that you make based on jealousy. When you're jealous of what somebody else has, instead of being content for them and happy for them. That's what it ends up causing. Philippians 4 and 11, look what Paul told him here. He says, not that I ever... I was ever in need, for I have learned. Say those three words with me. I have learned. You know what? It's really sad. Just a small percentage of Christians globally have learned this, especially in America. It says, I have learned how to be, what's that word? Say it out loud. Content. I mean, it's just with whatever I have. See, that is God's solution for envy. Learning to be content and say, I have learned to be content. The solution is contentment because when I'm content, I don't feel the pressure to go out and buy things that I don't need with money that I don't have to impress people I don't even like, you know. It's just, it's just so true. So true. And, and the next thing is you just got to, I got to get out of my selfishness. You got to get out of your selfishness and say, what do you mean by that? Selfishness is a big deal. People are so selfish. They think, well, they run, the, they go toward the envy, and, and then next thing you know, that makes them become selfish because selfishness is closed handed living. Do me a favor, take your hand out for a second. Take your hand out for a second. I just want you to close it and make a fist. 
You say, well, what do you mean by this here? When you close it and you make a fist, that's what selfishness is. It's whenever you say, God, you have blessed me with this money. You have blessed me with these finances. It is mine. I'm going to hold on to it and I am going to squeeze it. It belongs to me. And so you use it how, I'm going to use it how I want to because it's mine. I'm going to live close-handedly. I'm going to live selfishly. But living selfishly, I promise you, does not satisfy There's a great antidote to selfishness and materialism. You know what it is? Generosity. Generosity. So many people can't seem to be able to get that. If you want to release this being strapped in your life, I promise you it is through learning to be a generous person. Look at Deuteronomy. Keep that hand grip. Keep that hand grip. Just stay with me. Deuteronomy 15 here, look what it says. It says, therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. He's trying to teach God's people about the spirit and the life of living a life of generosity. You might want to underline that with your other hand, okay? Open-handed living. Now, take your hand now and just, you close your fist, now open it up. Open it up. You know, there, God wants to bless you, and He wants to bless you more, and it flow through your life. That's what God wants to do. He wants you to open your hands so blessings can flow through your hands. If you're clenching that what you've already got, there's no room for God to give you more because of your selfishness. Does that make sense? Say yes. That's good. That's good right there. I'm telling you. And I know it's hard for some of you to be able to understand that, that you want to open your hands. But God can't give you more blessings when you're clenching the blessings he's already given you and being selfish with it. It's like this. Let me, let me, let me do something here real quick. It's like this. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the blessings of God. Let's say this is the blessings of God. All right. Now, here's your closed fist. God wants to pour more blessings on you, right? He wants, more, he wants to pour more on you. But it, you just can't seem to get that much, can you? But all of a sudden, when you open it up, look at what God does. He, he pours blessings out on you, and it just flows through you. And he keeps your hands full. And he keeps your hands full. And he keeps your hands full. And you just keep flowing off on everybody else. That's the blessings that God wants to do. It's called open-handed living, church. That's what it's about. And I hope you get what I'm talking about. This open-handed living, really, what is it about? It's about living a generous lifestyle opposed to that closed-handed living, breaking the stranglehold of that selfishness and that hold in your life is focusing on living a life of generosity, being blessed and blessing other people. Open-handed living will always give you so much more joy than you can imagine because it breaks that materialism attitude that we often have. Say, God, I am putting you first in my life. I'm putting you first in my finances. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, Pastor, I'd like to be generous. And I like that illustration you did. I'd like to be open-handed. But I'm just just scared. Well, maybe you're just thinking, you know, I I do want to get that new car. I do want to get that new home. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But it's not through a spirit of selfishness. When your hand is opened here, God will flow and bless your life as you bless others' lives. You know, I've got to go get that new Tesla or I've got to go get that new Ford or whatever. And, uh, you know, so I can pull up to the red light and look over to the person next to me and go. (laughs) Last time I checked, a, a vehicle is to get you from point A to point B and back, right? Is that right? So it's just one thing about it, but so many people get so caught up and they're clenching everything that they've got. And the thing about it is people say, well, pastor, I'd like to be open-handed living. I'd like to give more to the church. I'd like to da, 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 da. The economy's really bad. Gas is high. Groceries are off the chart. And I just don't have enough. So I'm just going to continue living close-handed because I'm afraid to live and take that step of faith and live a generous life. Let me tell you what that is. That is fear of the enemy coming at your life that you can't step into the blessed life. From living a life of being close-handed to an open life of being open-handed and being a person that's going to be generous. That is what's going to keep you from living that materialistic lifestyle that will pull back the blessings 
additionally to your life and the blessings that God wants to give through your life. Don't listen to me. Don't allow Satan to strap down your life to where that you can't experience God's blessings to the full. And because God wants to bless your life more than you can ever imagine, ask, hope, or think. I hope you get that today. One more thing that's really cool that will release the straps of your life when it comes to financial things is that you invest in people to be able to get them into heaven. I mean, I just can't imagine a greater thing to be able to invest in in my life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 here in verse 19. It says, he or he was appointed, talking about these church leaders, by the churches to accompany us as we take the offering to Jerusalem, a service that glorifies the Lord and shows our eagerness to help. Man, they were cheerful givers. They, when it looks to the root of when they talked about them being cheerful givers here in the church of Corinth, they were hilarious. They hilariously gave. And man, today it's like the doggy downer point of the service. Why is it the doggy downer point of the service for so many people? Because you're living a materialistic life. You're following after your desires and not the desires that God wants to do in your life. So when it comes to investing in people in heaven, let me ask you this. Are you eagerly financially investing in people to be able to get in heaven like these Church of Corinth was doing? Ask yourself that question because it's so important because we're very strategic about what we do. We plan for ministries. We were, we were planning this past week, planning for what's going on in 24, for God to do great things and see more people come to Christ like never before. And you know what? We're just getting started. If you want to get in on the cuff of what God is doing, man, plan on landing here because God's doing amazing things through our community. Did you know this year already that we've had 314 people, 315 now from the person that gave their life to Christ in the last service, 315 people that have given their lives to Jesus already through our ministry this year. That's amazing. Did you know from the time that we started, almost 22 years ago, next March 30th will be 22 years, this is the first calendar year that we baptized more people this year than we have in a calendar year. We baptized 147 so far and got another baptism to go. That's amazing what God is doing. It's incredible. And man, whenever, for my wife, Shanda and I, you know, and let me tell you what our attitude is. This is our attitude. This is the most important thing that we could ever do with God's blessings in our life. You know what we always say? We get to do this. We get to do this. That is our attitude from our heart. So I hope and pray that you'll begin right now, if you're dealing with that spirit of materialism in your life, that you'll ask God, help me to move to your spirit, your desire of generosity. And when you do that, it'll be amazing what God is going to do in and through your life as you live open-handedly. Stand with me as we pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We cannot thank you enough for what you're doing, God. You're a gracious God. You're a loving God. You're a merciful God. And God, right now, Lord, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God, but these beautiful people here at Freedom Church today, they really do, Lord, want to be generous people. I believe that because they're here today, God. And I believe they're seeking your face and wanting to live for you, wanting to let your word be applied to their lives. And I pray, God, for those that might be bound down right now, God, with debt and stress and, and all those things and living in envy and pride and not want to admit. God, I pray, God, right now, Lord, that you're going to break their hearts for that which breaks yours. And that's to be able to live like you a giver like you, God, but live in your way, God, to be able to invest in that which is going to outlast this world. And God, I just pray, God, for each one here, God, we're going to do some practical things to help anyone that needs help when it comes to finances. We want to do that as a church, and, and that's going to be an opportunity for each one. So I pray, God, you'll do a mighty work, God, in every heart. As we continue praying, how many of you would love to be more faithful and more honoring to God and what he's given you? Don't raise your hand yet. Don't raise your hand yet because here's why it's so important as we continue to pray. You want to better honor God with what he's trusted you with. And I want you to think about it. Just think about it. Think about it in your heart and in your mind right now. Because some of you really don't do that at present. And I don't want you to lie. So what I want you to do right now is to say, God, as you have touched my heart, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to give it the very best shot I've ever done to break the spirit of materialism and become a generous 
person like you've created me to be. Now, if that's what you want to do, would you lift your hand right now and say, that's what I want to do. God, I want to be a part of what you're doing, God. You want to better honor God with what he trusts you with. God bless you. God, I pray that you're going to help break that spirit and that grip of materialism for people not to live in fear, God, but to in faith and becoming a giver like you, God. I pray that you help everyone honor you with their first fruits of what you have blessed them with, God, and you honor them. They honor you, God, as they worship you, God, and give back to you, God. Help people get into heaven, God. The blessings are innumerable, God, when we give back to you, God, and we live open-handed lives, your will and your way, following your desires, God. Help us, God, to prioritize you as first and manage what you've given us wisely. And remember that you're always faithful to us in little things. We're going to be faithful to you, God, in everything, God. We trust you more. Maybe you're here today and you came for the first time or maybe you, you right now, you just feel God's Holy Spirit touching and nudging your heart right now. And you're, maybe you're beginning to think about being a generous person. Let me tell you, the most generous person that ever lived was Jesus Christ, God the Father and His Son. God the Father said that He sent His Son to be able to give His life. That is a full spirit of generosity. Jesus loved us enough that He could have went back to the throne of God and called down legions of angels and got out of this world, but he didn't do it. He came down the stairway of heaven, Jesus did. He put on skin. He was born of a virgin Mary. That means the Holy Spirit of God impregnated Mary so he would not be born into sin. He walked on this earth for 33 years. He did more than the Bible says that books could even contain of all of what Jesus did. And next thing you know, he gave his life, his sinless life, took my place and yours on a cross so that you could have a great life now and have a home in heaven. That is the full spirit of a generous, loving, merciful God. And that's what he done for you in your life. Now, if you want to live a life to the full and you want heaven as your home, now as he's knocked on your heart, he wants to ask you to be able to ask him to come and be a part of what God is doing. And he wants to forgive you and he wants to give you the peace that passes all understanding. And if that's you today and you've never done it for the first time and you feel him knocking on your heart, would you simply just shoot your hand up right where you're at and say, I need to give my life to Jesus today, Pastor, for the very first time. I need to ask him to come into my heart. I need to be able to ask him to be the Lord of my life just right now. How many of you know you just need to come back to him as well? Just, I need to come back to God today. I, I've, just, I've just been staring away from him. I've been doing life the way I want to. Would you pray with me right now as we pray? God, right now, Lord, I pray you bless each heart here, God, that they be in tune with you, God, living your will and your way, God, being exactly the hands and feet of you, Lord Jesus, in our lives. And may you bless each one richly and immensely in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray and all of God's people say, amen. amen. Let's worship, church.